Hurry up. Hurry. Schmidt beer, the brew that grew to be best in the Great Northwest. Your finest craft beer, Rocky. Man to man, smoke Roy Tan. Cheers, everyone, and welcome to the Unfiltered Gentlemen. And now, here are Greg, Scott, and Dan coming at you ice cold and unfiltered. Hey, everybody, welcome into the Unfiltered Gentlemen. Just Greg here today. Uh, sorry, and you're welcome. The other guys are out on important assignment. They are doing some beer research for the show. But more importantly, I am here in the little old city of Camarillo. I am at the brand new Flatfish Brewing in Camarillo. I'm being joined by the brewer himself and owner and all-around guy who does a bunch of work over here, Mike Brown. Mike, thanks for joining us today. Good morning. Welcome to Flatfish. Thank you. Before we get into all the beer questions, this is a little unique. You guys are not just a brewery. In fact, brewery is very new. You guys have been a winery for quite some time. Yeah, we opened as a winery to the public in 2007. Kintara Cellars, for those of That's you right. who have not been here. We found out about Kintara uh, about two and a half years ago, I think, and uh, came here a few times. The last time we were here, it was like, oh, did you know we're opening a brewery? Do tell. <laughs> so we had to come back and uh, get involved with that. Like I said, you run this place with your wife. You're also the brewer and the winemaker also? Yes. All right. Yep. So talk about your responsibilities here. Sounds like you're quite busy. Back in the late 90s, Chris and I decided to plan forward for our eventual leaving corporate world and mm -hmm. starting our own businesses. And we sat down and evaluated at that time breweries versus wineries. And uh, I grew up in Lodi where there's nothing but wineries. So, you know, my experience and flavor profiles at the time were wine oriented. And then we looked at the cost of starting a brewery at that time and just said, okay, we're starting a winery. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it wasn't quite as cool then. Um, well, it, it really it boiled down to the 300,000, 400,000 that you needed to get one started at yeah. that time because there wasn't the the same pool of suppliers that there are today. So how did you become a winemaker originally? Was there schooling involved? Did you just little Googling? Schooling? I mean, I'm, a, I'm an engineer by degree from Cal Poly, oh, okay. uh, which gives you a nice broad background, uh, a lot of chemistry in my background, mm -hmm. and always very hands-on person and, and education. So went to some courses at Davis from a wine and finance aspect of the industry. But uh, the, the main core of learning winemaking is a hands-on approach. Yeah. I worked at Camarillo Custom Worked. I volunteered at Camarillo <laughs> Custom Crush uh, for three years. Nice. Yeah, we've been there many a time as yeah, well. Yeah, it's you really have to, as with all of these things, uh, you know, I tell people you can read all the cookbooks you want, but until you stand at the stove, you're you're never a chef. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, same with beer making or anything. Yep. I stayed away from beer making for many years because so many people do so many great things. I just didn't want to screw it up. All right, or, yeah, it, it gets an intimidating list of ingredients to play with. Yeah, and hop schedules and all this. Yep. What is a mash? Um, all right, cool. That's the winemaking side. When did you start brewing beer? Uh, I started brewing beer before I started making wine. Oh. I was a home wine. <laughs> Home brewer because uh, with grapes, you get grapes one time a year. Right. And you have to wait a year, two, or three become, before it becomes a, a beverage that's a competitive product. And with beer, you know, the ingredients are available year-round. Yeah. It's fun to do. And so I was a home brewer for lots and lots of years. Very cool. Um, who or what beer maybe inspired you to get into home brewing? Hmm. I don't know that there was a particular brew. I mean, my f palate preference is in the Browns, Porters mm -hmm. kind of range. That's the the beers that I would look for. But I'll, you know, my experience over the last 20 years, those beers have disappeared. Yes, very much so. And Especially the Browns. Yeah. And, and for in my view, no reason. They're a great beer. Yeah, they're they're one of my favorites. They're so universal, and they go with everything. Good food beer. They're good food beer. They're good hot day beer. They're just super universal, and people are not uh, into them, I guess, right now. Well, and certainly, you know, when you look on the 
the grocery store shelf, you don't see very many representations. No, no. Especially if you're looking at the craft. I mean, it's a lot of IPAs and then maybe a couple of stouts. And that yep. seems to dominate the shelves. Yeah, definitely. You know, plenty of stouts out there. I think they shelf well yeah. from a packaging standpoint. Yeah, they last well. All right. Speaking of browns and beers and brewing, let's uh, let's get into the first offering in front of us. Okay. The, the first one we have is a uh, British brown. Okay. And this one just came out of the fermenter. Nice. So nice and fresh. Yeah, it might might still have a little bit of a uh, little bit of nose on it, but we'll see. It's got a little haze to it. A little haze. Yeah. No, it's just going through fining. It is nice and light. Just a slight bit of hop in there. Mm-hmm. This is the you know most people that I pour it for as a as a pilot batch. It was oh this is like Newcastle and that sort of thing. <laughs> I said mm, yeah, but it's got a little more flavor than what you might get Thank out of a you? Newcastle. <laughs> yeah, no, it's just a little richer representation of a good any time of day. Sit down and have a pint. Yeah, you know, I I love the um, quote unquote compliments that people give you about beer, and they think they're being very nice about it. But what they're really is is kind of insulting you. You know, people only have certain points of reference, and that's where today we're going to be tasting through a British brown, American amber, American brown porter, and then a pale ale. And as I've learned with wine, people are going to give you their response to your beverage, whether yeah. it's wine or beer from the perspective of the best example or the last example True. that they had of that kind of product. Whether it's right or wrong, it's a it's a point of reference for them. That's true. I made a Hefeweizen at home, and I gave it to somebody, and their response, with which was meant nothing but praise, was, wow, that was really good. It tastes like a mix between Pacifico and Budweiser. <laughs> And I said, "Oh, but did you like it?" Yeah, like, yeah, it was really good. <laughs> really good. I, oh, 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 that was a ni- okay. Th- thank you. I guess I, d- I didn't know that was a compliment yeah. about a Hefeweizen. But it's the only representation they they have. And yeah, I was uh, I was taking it back. So when I made my my next one, I was like, you know what? This one's really good, and I don't think that person would appreciate it. I'm going to hold this one back. Yeah. <laughs> you can have the next beer when I make my pale ale or something. All right. So when did you start coming around to craft beer in general? Maybe not necessarily brewing, but like, was there a point where you're like, hey, I, I don't want big beer, or, or maybe you still really like big beer? Uh, no, I don't. My son drinks Coors Light. <laughs> that's, that's, one of, that's as close as I get to big beer. Uh-huh. <laughs> but uh, I, I think it really just as, for me, when Ennegrin opened, mm-hmm. uh, we live in Moore Park. And we love Ennegrin. No, Chris and, and the guys for a lot of years, and watched their progression, and... When we took on additional space in 2014, it was for putting in the brewery. Mm-hmm. And it was interesting to watch Ennegrin grow through their stages yeah, and uh, listen to their trials and tribulations and such. <laughs> and they're still growing. They just got their uh, canning line. Yeah, yeah. But for us, it was, it was always part of our plan, but it was a, oh, more a question of when the money and the time and the and the capacity made it made it all happen. Yeah, yeah. What was your first homebrew if you can remember? It was a uh, Newcastle clone. Ironically. Yeah, yeah. it tastes like Newcastle. Yep. yep. And then a uh, Irish red. Oh, nice. The second one. When was that? How long ago? Uh be 2002. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> um and what was your first production beer here? This brown. Okay. American brown. And what was the decision behind going with that first? It's the beers I like to drink. <laughs> I like that. If you're not drinking what you want, then you're not drinking right. So you kind of mentioned it. Talk about your day job prior to being in the, the alcohol business. Started as a manufacturing engineer and design engineer for uh, discrete products, a variety of discrete products. Okay. From pressure test equipment to fiber optic test equipment to jewelry manufacturing, <laughs> furniture. You know, If it was to be something to be made, it was... Something to be built. And Very cool. It's kind of maybe the background. I mean, you did a lot of your own work on the brewery here, right? Yeah, we built everything. I used an electrician and everything else we've done. So. That's very cool. And do you get like this? I don't know. It's gonna get cheesy, but uh, sense of overall kind of pride. They're like, I built this. Is it? Or are you just so used to building things? It's not. Yeah, a big deal? it's just you know, <laughs> people go. They are always like, oh, are you excited? It's like I'll be excited six months after we're open. That, that's when, <laughs> when the excitement really works. Yeah, yeah. pouring beer and... when you're when you're done through all the pilot process. Yeah, that makes sense. I get it. Um, all right, so let's move on to the next one. Here. American amber. American amber. This is not something that is 
available enough on shelves. No, no. This is another one that, for me, underrepresented. It's got a great smell to it. Nice color. Another one that is just uh, part of what we're doing here is producing beers that work also for wine drinkers. Okay, that because makes sense. A, a large portion of our existing wine customers are beer consumers. Right. It, it's funny how they feel like they're cheating on you as a winery by going out and having craft beer. It's like, hey, I drink craft beer. It's good stuff. <laughs> well, now you can stop cheating and come yeah, exactly, get a little yeah. two-for-one combo. I can come, come get it. All right, so give us some, some tasty notes on this. Well, this is uh, what I would say continental flavor profile, not clean crisp american profile okay um the yeast really is for me the defining flavor profile of this beer it's a pretty straightforward pale malt mm-hmm. based amber uh, a little bit of chocolate malt in there but it, the yeast profile really comes through and it's also part of what we're doing with this flight of beer is the first seven beers is to get some feedback from customers, see what's selling and see what the feedback is to say, okay, I want more of this or less of that. Sure. So we have a fairly broad range of beer, which I think is somewhat surprising. Yeah, especially for a new brewery. A lot of times it's, you know, one, two or three beers and and that's it. So it's very cool to see that you're opening up with so many. Walk us through kind of a a normal brew day for you. We're looking at some of the equipment earlier and, and we'll post some pictures on the social media so everybody can see what we were looking at. What's what's your typical brew day like? Well, I think the the baseline people have to know, or the brewers that are out there, home brewers, it's by design a barrel and a half system, single pot, single mash kettle, all electric uh, system that operates kind of like a big coffee brewer. <laughs> and you mash into the same vessel that you ultimately boil in. Mm-hmm. So it's by manufacturer, a barrel and a half. We've kind of discovered better ways of utilizing the equipment to push it to a two, two and a half barrel system. So we start the day at 7 a.m., turn on a hot liquor tank mm-hmm. and heat up our strike water, milling, mash in. Usually by, we start at 7, we're mashing in by 8.30, finish our mash 9.30, and then we'll go through a at least a two-hour sparge. Okay, wow. And uh, part of it is in the electric system, we've got to wait for, you know, for the temperature rise from right. from 152-ish up to boil. And for this kettle, it takes an hour, hour and a half to two hours, depending on the size of the boil. So it gives me plenty of time to sparge, mm-hmm. get good efficiencies, and... Uh, and then move into a move into boil, and we're usually done with boil going to heat exchanger around uh, two thirty. All right, so full day. Full day. And each fermenter holds two batches. Two batches. Yeah, we double batch. Very nice. So flatfish. By the way, if I didn't say at the top of the show, flatfishbrewing dot com and flatfish brew on Facebook. Where did the name of flatfish come from? Well, as we've learned in wine for a lot of years, it's. Naming your wines and naming your business is one of the hardest parts of of anything. Yeah. You know, to find something that's not stepping on too many toes. Right. Too too close. And also giving you a name that you can then name your beer or your whatever your product is. So uh, we struggled for months. I mean, we knew this brewery was coming. I was like, man, we got, I got to fill out federal licensing paperwork (laughs) and I got to have a brand. (laughs) So. It was uh, a lot of lot of conversations, but our son is a avid ocean fisherman. Okay, here off the local California coast. Right, we, we're not too far from yeah, the beach. not too far from the beach. And local halibut is a, a specialty of the area, and uh, he's the one who came up with the flatfish, which is a uh, slang for what goes for halibut and a whole family of fish that that populate the the very bottom of the ocean. Looked around. Found nothing. <laughs> it was too much. I mean, there's other fish related breweries, but yeah. nothing too f- close. And uh, so that worked and went on with the branding from there. Nice. Are buying domains and all that? Yes. Good stuff. Yeah. Have you named any of the beers yet? Uh, yeah. We have uh, the Amber is Amberjack. Okay. The British Brown is not named. The American Brown is Grunion Runs, not Grunion Run, but Grunion Runs. Right. That was my wife's <laughs> little twist there and then uh, the brown is uh, flounder pounder 
and uh, or the porter, excuse me, and the pale ale is uh, barn door flatty. Nice, I like that. Yeah, the the all of the names are in slang of ocean fish related. That's right. the those are the criteria. <laughs> you got you to keep on brand. Yep. Very cool. Do you have, I mean, I think we've talked about this a little bit, you know, in, in the way of browns and such, but do you have a specialty or a certain focus when it comes to, to beer making? I wouldn't say I have a specialty yet. Okay. I mean, this is my experience as a home brewer is um, I would brew browns, porters, I, and stouts months before the christmas holidays right and have everything bottled up and then go to parties and that's that was what i would bring so i've really been focused on that those mid-range browns and porters and then stouts aged stouts the ipas are new for me yeah but everything in the pale down to the to the ambers and the british browns those are things that i would brew all the time just normal stuff yeah was it hard going from homebrew scale to scaling up to a professional size that was the thing that i was most concerned about i mean i the recipe development and coming up with flavor profiles were things that uh you know i'm a home cook and winemaking for for many many years the working with ingredients and coming up with a flavor profile that you think is going to be interesting and and has layers and complexity right those are those are things i'm very familiar with going into the higher hop level beers, that's been actually my area of most concern about getting something that is so bitter that, you know, it's not something that I would want to drink. Blowing out some palates. Yeah, blowing out palates. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm really comfortable in the lower range beers, but the recipes have scaled well once I figured out how to uh, work this larger brew system with the yeah. kind of efficiencies that the recipes were initially designed for. That was the biggest transition issue. And I would imagine your background as an engineer probably kind of helps. Oh yeah, you, no, you're doing the numbers on the fly. Going, yeah. Okay, uh, <laughs> I have to have, to, and that was to some degree the benefit of having a double batch. Right. So if the first brew was hitting under the numbers I was looking for, then I could make adjustments in the second batch and then hit the batch. Kind of even out in the yeah. end. Yeah. Um, all right. Speaking of which, let's let's move on to our third one here. To the American Brown. Yes. Grunion runs, 4.7. Nice and sessionable. Yeah. We had a gentleman sit here and drink pint after pint of this, <laughs> which was, I, you know, I took it as a very good compliment. <laughs> yeah. If he's not pouring it out, that's a good sign. Yeah. This is great. Yeah. It's got a very toasty smell on the nose. Yeah, toasty, but not. Um, this was one of the adjustments made between the pilot and production was backing off on a little bit of the the chocolate notes that are prominent in the mm-hmm. porter and and even more so in an in an imperial or a stout. But you know, so this needs to be toasty, but not the not the same flavor profile as what the porter is going to be. Right, toasty, but a little bit lighter. Yeah, uh, this is. Not too thick, goes down very nicely. Uh, it's kind of surprising when people are, oh, I don't know, oh, dark beer. Oh. I love that response. Put it in your mouth for crying out loud. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, it's not a dark, I mean, dark in color, yes. Yes. But it, it's not a Guinness. It's not a milkshake. It is no. very drinkable, very doable, very sessionable. Once again, people don't realize like how universal browns can be. You know, this could be an all-day beer. Uh, and the fact that it's 4.7 even more of an all-day beer. This, yep. this could be an all-day football Sunday. Well, and, and browns give you a base grain bill to work other things. So this, it's going to be interesting to take the grain bill, make some tweaks to it, mm-hmm. and, and come up with different iterations of this. Have you uh, mashed in for the brown yet and then off the same grains, like made a, a lighter? No. I've I've run through that as a home brewer. Yeah. Um, I cannot think of the name of that process. It's fancy. Well, it's uh, if you read historically, that's British. Yeah. Going I mean, stouts to porters to browns. Right. That's how it was done. I, I did a home brewing session with my son in law. He had gotten all the ingredients and he was all prepped and everything else. And I, I we were vacationing with them, and uh, he's doing an imperial stout. And he gets done with his runoff for the Imperial, and he's, and he's moving on. And I said, what are we going to do? you got a lot of grains right. here. <laughs> so we just uh, heated up some more water and continued on. Nice. And 
I think he got, you know, he had a he had a five gallon batch of his Imperial, right? And we had seven gallons of of what turned out to be a nice, you know, wasn't probably on the lighter side of a porter, but yeah. more than a brown. And he was he was quite happy. I said, Oh no, yeah, there's plenty of good beer in there. Yeah, I've yet to do that as a home brewer, but that's what I want to I want to try that. That sounds like a lot of fun, just kind of making the one you want to make and then seeing what happens with the next one. Yeah, that's where with the system that we have here and and production brewing, you can continue that mash out to as long as you want. Right. Different styles. Speaking of brewing and, and reusing, are you guys harvesting your own yeast or are you buying new for each batch? It's a nerdy beer question that most people are like, who, what? Out of the seven batches we've run, I've been able to move move yeast from one fermenter to another on a couple batches it's really nice when you can do that <laughs> yeah well i'm sure on this scale like it probably saves a ton of money too well it it's interesting that's one of the transitions both from home brewing and from winemaking and winemaking there isn't any yeast to reuse oh okay because first off we use multiple strains in every one of the lots uh, and we'll separate the fruit and ferment several bins with one yeast and ferment other bins with a different yeast and then combine the wine okay. post-fermentation. But the yeast is in such a high alcohol environment that the viability of wine yeast is really petered out, very low viability at the end of fermentation. Right. So there isn't enough activity to pitch into something else, even if you could harvest it. But with beer, there's you have high viability and yeah, there's no reason not to reuse it. So long as you're making a beer where that yeast is complementary to the, right, to the yeah. next batch. Where we're doing seven different beers, that's been somewhat challenging to say, oh, they're, <laughs> and they're all at this point consistently. Let's talk about kind of the area for a little bit. You know, you're in Camarillo, which I grew up in Camarillo. And if you said Camarillo, people that looked at you super confused or they went, oh, the outlets. <laughs> well, that got to have a benchmark or, right. you know, a reference point. Yeah. So we're, we're the outlet place. Camarillo was stereotypically not a lot of fun, at least when I was growing up, 80s and 90s. It was, there was nothing to do. Everything closed by 8 o'clock. Things are starting to get a lot cooler now. Yeah, we More... stay up until 8.30. Ooh, <laughs> you're bucking the <laughs> yeah. trends here in Camarillo. <laughs> Only you and Denny's are open that late. Um, but things are starting to turn around. It's starting to become more fun. Wineries were the original you know, the cool thing to do in Camarillo. Then Institution opened, and now you guys are, are opening. What's it like being the second brewery in a, in a city like Camarillo. You know, it. The, the funniest thing that I hear is people go, oh, now Institution has some competition. <laughs> I'm like, have you been to Institution? <laughs> we're, we're in different parts of the market. And I know Sean real well. They're a great group of guys. They make great beers. And we don't see them as competition because Sean doesn't serve wine. We, yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you you cater to multiple audiences. You know, our target customer is the the couple where one person solid wine drinker, the other person, well, I could have a beer, I could have wine, I could have a you know a mixed drink, uh, you know, and that's that's where the customers are. Yeah, I had to do some converting. I am with someone who used to be a solid wine drinker, and. Uh, now she's a solid beer drinker. Yeah, part of it is is getting out, and that's to me the the best thing of craft is giving customers a, a variety of product and let them find what they enjoy. Absolutely. What would you say is different about Flatfish? Like what sets you guys apart from others in the industry? Well, I mean, the wine, obviously. First and foremost, uh, there was a law that went into effect January first of twenty eighteen that allows us allows wineries and breweries that are physically located next to each other to carve out areas where those products can be enjoyed in a common area. Okay. And we're certainly, as far as Southern California, one of the first ones taking advantage of that. Yeah. Physically, it's going to be hard for other people. Uh, I think you're going to see wineries starting breweries, uh, as we have. I think yeah. that it's much easier for a winery to take up brewing than for a brewery to take up wine. That's Yeah, I think you need a lot more space. You need a lot more space, and I, I think... You know, if I had started with beer, which, you know, the, the product can turn through the, the manufacturing process in three weeks to six weeks. Right. And you walk up to that person and say, well, now you're going to put three years into your next product. 
Wait, what? Yeah, yeah, their eyes would roll out of their head and you would end the conversation there. Yeah. From a concept, or at least serious concept, not like, hey, I'd like to do this. But from concept to opening, how long did it take to open Flatfish? Four years. Four years. And was that a lot of planning or was that having to deal with uh, local government? Like, what's the big setback? Um, lining up capacity in the inside the facility. Mm-hmm. We produced wine for other wineries. Oh, okay. And we were committed in contracts to finish out their products sure. to allow us to free up space to convert that space to beer production. So that was one part of it. Two, winding down my outside business so that I had more time to do this business. And then third... You know, early on, we talked about hiring a, a brewing consultant and those types of things to help me through the step up from home brewing operations to production operations. Right. And talked to a lot of guys, looked for a lot of guys, found a couple, and then just went through it and said, you know, I take the time, do the research because it's, it affects the facility. Uh, it affects money and it affects how you're going to respond when uh you know i tell people on the wine side winemaking happens when things aren't going right <laughs> otherwise it's pretty you know routine the yeast to do the heavy lifting for yeah. making these products and you can have a a process that you understand and try and you know rinse and repeat kind of situation but when things aren't going well or when equipment isn't doing things or you start doing what you want them to do. What are you going to do? So I took more time, brought my education up on that, took courses through Oregon State. Oh, nice. And um, so when I'm opening and producing these beers, uh, I'm much, much more confident in myself making that transition. Yeah. So you really, I mean, you've taken the, obviously the classes on winemaking and then you took a course on, on brewing. That's, I mean. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people just kind of, oh, I can homebrew. Let's do this. Yeah, it's it's the courses on quality assurance, yeah. which are, for me, from a brewing perspective, that were the most important. Yeah, make sure you can repeat the results. and yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, and knowing what the numbers are behind the brew. Yeah. And, and being very comfortable what's driving it, because when you're throwing out $25 a grain from a from a brew process at home, that's one thing. But sure. when you're throwing out 10 times that amount or, <laughs> or 20 times that amount, in a production environment, it, you know, it's 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 worth the investment. Yeah, that hurts. Let's move on to our next one. Yeah, now we're on to porter. Porter. Very chocolatey on the nose. Yeah, now here, here the decision was porter, not stout. How did that decision come about? My personal experience with stouts is I can have about 10 ounces, <laughs> and then I'm done. Yeah. Stouts are typically heavier than porter. I mean, a lot yeah. of people kind of throw both names interchangeably, but not that it should be. I mean, a stout is a heavier, thicker, more milkshakey uh, type of beverage. Yeah, and I, I'll do a stout as a seasonal in the wintertime. Sure, and that's when you want a stout. Yeah, and and it's, you know, nothing wrong with stouts, but I just, we're here in Southern California, and something that's a little more quaffable and sit down in a social environment, not sit back and go in. I am full. <laughs> <laughs> that was a meal. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this is great. It's a lot of chocolate, a little bit of coffee in there, a little bit of roastiness. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was the name on this one? Uh, this is uh, Flounder Pounder. Flounder Pounder. That's right. This is uh, this is really good. The crowd agrees. Yeah. This was uh, kegged on Tuesday. Nice. Very fresh. And you've got a ton of barrels out there because of the winemaking, obviously. Yes. Any yeah. uh, barreling program on the beer side coming? No plan on, on barreling at the moment. More so, barrels are biologically there we consider them an open vessel Mm -hmm. and the biology of wine and the biology of beer can coexist but there's bugs that are good for one that aren't good for the other going both directions so we've uh, said for now we'll keep everything (laughs) very closed up and stainless on the beer side and wait and see what how things develop keep those wine bugs away from those beer bugs yeah what is your favorite brewery other than your own hmm Probably Institution, Five Threads, Ennegrin. Those would be the top three that I that I frequent and yeah. enjoy what they're doing. Love those guys. Uh, went to 14 Cannon actually for the first time about a week and a half ago. Oh, really, yeah. really enjoyed what I had there. Really nice. Uh, like their atmosphere and ambiance is really nice. Yeah, they've done a great job on the on the tasting room. And and Nick, who's been on the show, is is nuts. He's the mad scientist over yeah. there. 
So since you're still uh, fairly new to the area and, and as a brewery, not to the area, winery's been here forever, but as a brewery, fairly new to the area, how do you spread the word? How do you get the word out? How do you drum up some some interest? Well, we have a, a fairly large customer base from our winery. It helps. And we've been talking to those people for solid two and a half years. And it, I think a lot of people were in the mind of, good grief, when are you going to actually open? Because we, we've been talking about this forever. So we have, again, a good base of customers there, yeah. and my expectation is they're going to spread the word. But the other surprising thing is the number of people that have just shown up, even before we started to do any kind of outside marketing, mm -hmm. um, that said, hey, uh, there's a brewery around here somewhere, isn't there? <laughs> and, have uh, you been on Yelp? Yeah, no, I swear the guy, first guy that showed up, he watched when our license was approved. Oh, wow. And when the license Dedication. popped up, that was like, oh, okay, there's a new brewery. <laughs> He's got a Google alert set yeah. for uh, Well, and, and we have people show up to just go, do you have coasters yet? We want coasters. We, I have a 1800 coaster oh, collection kind of thing. I thought I was bad. That's hilarious. Yeah, we uh, when we first were here for the winery about two and a half years ago, we were told like, oh, yeah, there will be a brewery opening soon. And so yeah. we've been keeping our ear. There. Every time we so, came in. Soon like, is relative. Right, right yeah. Every time we came in, it was, so how about that brewery? Oh, we're working on it. Well, and there's a distillery in the pipeline too, so. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. You guys are talking about doing distilling, and mm -hmm. and we were just up at um, Shelter Distilling in Mammoth. I don't know if you've been up there. No. they It's the former head brewer of Mammoth Brewing okay. and a couple other guys, and they are distilling and making beer, and they're essentially using the same beginning process to distill yep. as they are for making beer, and they talked about how similar that is and how Very easy similar. it is to go from one to the other, so. Tell us about your potential distilling program. Well, um, we're going to start distilling wine mm -hmm. um, because we, we inherited a, a good inventory from another winery. Um, so we have lots of brandy stock and, and gin stock to, nice. to work with, um, which takes a little pressure off using the brew system to start producing warts for, sure. for whiskeys. And that's part of the... You know, decision about using a consultant and early on is to say, well, I need someone who knows both the long range of distilling plus right. what's going on with brewing and equipment decisions and those types of things. So the distilling portion, my mind spins up in about four months. Oh, okay. After, after the beers that we have in the pipeline go through another cycle or two of production, and then I'm comfortable to, to train the next person to take over that, that daily activity of, yeah. of running the brewery. And is this another license or you, could we you already start have tomorrow? The oh, okay. Yeah. So you're yeah. already good license to go. In, in place. Very nice. I like to ask brewers on the West Coast, what do you think of hazy IPAs? Um, the New England IPA. You know, I, I put them like a lot of beers. There's great examples and there's others that you just go, hmm, oh, that just looks like a muddy burp, right. muddy beer. <laughs> or a muddy burp. <laughs> yeah. uh, but Why is this great? I, I've had really nice examples of them. I don't know that the experimentation to me is there's still lots of research to be done to say, well, is that flavor because of the haze or is that flavor just because of the recipe particulars of that beer right but no i've had nice examples of it and i don't know about you i found that a lot of the west coast versions of east coast ipas are some of my favorite well I, again i go back to my my background in wine and and it's like put a blindfold on somebody and put it in front of them yeah and ask their opinion versus not a blindfold, you're going to get different answers. It's true. And I don't know that the hazy is the issue. It is a visual reference for someone. Mm -hmm. And we'll see if that really plays out long term with the research that supports the consistent production of those beers. Right. All right. We have a few listener questions. And then I'm going to throw some rapid fire questions at you. Uh, John wants to know, what beer have you been most proud of? The first one that I got out of the fermenter, that'd be the American <laughs> the American Brown. <laughs> yes, it came out and it tasted good. Jess wants to know what beer, yours or otherwise, do you miss? Hmm. Can't say that I miss anything. I just, you know, the nice thing about craft, there's plenty of examples. So if someone stops producing, there's unfortunately someone right there behind yeah. you to fill that spot. It's true. I will say the, I mean, it's readily available but I had a Guinness at the Black Rose 
in Boston in a must have been mid nineties. Okay. And I don't, the keg must have just come off the boat. It was so <laughs> delicious. You know, you got it, can't separate the, the location and the people and everything else with the experience. But that was just one of those you sat down and went, that is a great beer. Yeah. And there's some places that will, uh, do the proper like gas mixture. Like there's a place in Camarillo called Brennan's where they do, I think it's like a 75, 25 nitro to CO2. Mm-hmm. And like, that's how it's supposed to be where other places they just throw it on CO2 or they just throw it on yeah, nitro. So and what, go. what they got. Yeah. So it kind of depends on, on who's serving it too. Uh, Shannon wants to know what's your favorite style to brew versus drink. Hmm. I would say on the production side, I'm still, I'm still new to, doing a production brew on a lot of these i just finished the brew of the of the double ipa and as you're dumping in pounds of hops uh, compared to experience as a home brewer right. a few uh, ounces a few ounces <laughs> yeah a ziploc baggie you know I'm, and i'm looking at the dry hopping schedule and it's it's seven or eight pounds of dry hop Ooh. now it's only a five barrel batch so you, know, you got to keep it in perspective yeah. but it's still a pile of hops that you're dumping in those are those are interesting times yeah i bet um all right before we get to the rapid fire let's check out our last beer Ah, here pale ale pale ale very light on the nose yeah now of course i'm a fan of uh sierra nevada pale ale Mm -hmm. that's just kind of a a good commercial benchmark for for pales as far as i'm concerned i mean it's been around for so long and it's still delicious you just can't go wrong well and that's the same on the porter the deschutes Black Butte. Oh, we love Black Butte. So good. Good commercial representations. And this pale is good. Kind of starts off nice and malty, ends up a little hoppy on the finish, but not too hoppy because uh, the person in this room that's not a fan of hops is over there drinking it. So <laughs> clearly that's uh, a sign it's not too hoppy. No, it's it's the intro for the hoppier styles. Yeah. So you got to keep it approachable or you're never going to be able to get somebody to cross and say, okay, try this IPA, try the double IPA. Right. You got to work your way into it. Yeah. Do you have an uh, IBU on this? Not off the top of my head. Okay. But I think it's in the 50 range. It's Calculated? Like, yeah. Okay. But again, the experience here and the education says IBUs you know, are, forget them. It's like oak and tannins in wine. Right. How they express to every person is an individual response. You know, calculated versus what really comes through the kettle is one of those, hey, put it in your mouth. It meets your meets your desires yeah. or doesn't. And calculated usually ends up being higher than the actual. Yeah, way higher. And way plus higher. with all the East Coast IPAs, I mean, they're not putting hops until the end of the boil. So you're getting yeah. like almost zero IBUs, it, but it's the hoppiest beer you've ever had. It really, you know, not under, not knowing the production process that a beer has gone through. It's like, hey, you can calculate whatever you want to calculate. I won't know until I put it in my mouth. Right. I try to explain that to people all the time. Like, oh, this is an IPA. It's, you know, it's super hoppy, but it says it's only 25 IBUs. Like, let me tell you how, how hops work in well, a hop schedule. That's what I really like about the the double that I'm that I'm brewing is it's got tons of hops, but those hops come in as layers of flavor, not something that's just going to blow out your palate. Yeah. And the nice thing about double IPAs is along with putting the hops in a little bit later so they don't blow out your palate, they also have more booze to them. So that really hides the the bitterness and kind of balances everything out. Yep. Which people, oh, double IPA must be super hoppy. <laughs> like, that's not necessarily true. All right. We've got some rapid fire questions for you. Uh, just first thing that comes to your mind, first beer you ever drank. Mm, probably a Miller. <laughs> first beer that you ever brewed? American Brown. Well, it was a British Brown Newcastle knockoff. Okay. First beer that you brewed and sold? Brewed and sold. Be the uh, Grunion Runs, American Brown. Nice. Are you a fan of cans or bottles? Hmm. If I have a cozy, I like I, I'm good with either one. Um, I drink out of bottles more often. I would say. Okay. Favorite beer slash food pairing? I, I would go with a brown, <laughs> American brown and good barbecue. Nice. I like that. It's Tuesday night. What are you drinking? Hmm. Well, at our house, Tuesday night is the open wine that we've been given. Okay. Until you find something you enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes it's one bottle, sometimes it's six. So <laughs> that's Tuesday night at our house. That's one of my favorite answers. Um, what is your beercation destination? 
Right. I love going up to Santa Rosa and uh, Russian River Brewing. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, Bend, Oregon. That's yeah. another mecca for me. Let's go stand in line at Russian River. And- yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And then they bring out this palette of I don't know twenty plus tasters for people. And is it like, is it twenty four? I think. Yeah. It's yeah. We huge. were up there a couple of years ago. <laughs> it's like a surfboard of tasters. Yep. It's yep. insane. We just said we'll take you know the whole flight and like okay, and then they come out with it like holy crap. I'm trying to think of the the ice cream place that would. Uh, bring out this bowl with all this different ice cream in it, and it kind of oh, reminds me of that. <laughs> uh, what's your favorite outside non-flatfish beer? The one I really am liking is Ennegrin's Maybach. Oh, yeah, that is good. We had that at uh, Frillings Fest when they tapped it from the barrel. Yeah, it's, it's, that's a good beer. That is a good beer. Uh, and then finally, favorite non-beer hobby? <sighs> you know, my favorite thing is to sit with a cup of coffee on my patio in the morning. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, with a with a chihuahua in your lap. <laughs> uh, all right. Like I said before, flatfishbrewing.com and Flatfish Brew on Facebook. If you guys are in Camarillo, it's 126 Northwood Road, which is uh, near the end of the runway here at the Camarillo Airport, yep. if you're trying to find out where, where they are. Uh, so please come on out to Flatfish Brewing. Say hi to Mike. Tell him you guys heard about uh, Flatfish on the show and... He's very open to showing you around and selling you a tasty beer. Yep. Very cool. Anything else I missed? Oh, I think I think we've had nice beer. <laughs> we have definitely had nice beer. That is <laughs> that is accurate. All right. Thanks everybody for listening. Mike, thank you, sir. You're welcome. And we will catch everyone next week. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks one last time to Mike for sitting down and spending some time and most importantly, sharing some tasty, tasty beers. Love those browns. If you guys are in the Ventura County and more specifically Camarillo area. That's in Southern California. Make sure you hit up Flatfish Brewing. Go say what's up to Mike and everyone that's there. Let them know you heard about them from the Unfiltered Gentleman. You can find them at 126 Northwood Road in Camarillo. You can get them on the interwebs at flatfishbrewing.com or at Flatfish Brew on all the social medias. And speaking of interviews, we have a couple of cool ones coming up, one of which is from Epig, E-P-P-I-G, Brewing down in San Diego. They have a really cool history. They have some great beers going on. Can't wait to share that with you guys. I think you're really going to enjoy it. In the meantime, don't forget you can find us on the interwebs at theunfilteredgentleman.com. We have the store with a bunch of new shirts. You guys can go get decked out in some official Unfiltered Gentleman swag. Find us on the social medias at The Unfiltered Gentleman, except for Twitter at Unfiltered Gents. Don't forget to leave us your drunk voicemails, 805-538-BEER. It's 2337. That's it for now. Make sure you guys are staying hydrated. And on that note, good night, everybody. Good night.